it's very, very clear that we're overfishing and overfishing dramatically and that we're doing other things to the oceanic environment that are definitely not in our medium or long-term interest to say nothing about the creatures themselves. So it sort of falls into the category of solvable problem with potentially proper interventions. The other thing is, as far as I can tell, there's no losers to fixing this. You know, the, the oceanic mismanagement problem is of such magnitude, with the exception of certain species, that if we keep up our rate of fishing for the next 20 years, there's not going to be an awful lot left. And that's not going to be very good for the large corporations that, you know, that, that make their economic living off the oceans. And it's going to be a real hard on us if we want to eat. And then, of course, there's the loss of the beauty and, and the diversity and, and also the, the potential to truly transform the nature of the ecosystems of the ocean in a way that really won't be good. I mean, our planet's covered two-thirds by oceans, and that's a lot. And you know, we're messing with them in a really serious way. And part of the reason for that is, you know, fish are fish, and they've got scales, and they're not that brainy. And we're going after them with, like, 21st century technology. You know, we use planes to spot them and, and sonar to find out where they are and, and you know, like, ultrasonic <laughs> mapping to, to, to check out the structure of the bottom of the ocean and massive nets and, like, those bloody things don't have a chance and that's not so good, you know. It's inappropriate use of technology. Unnatural history of the sea, I love that. The most important fish in the sea, that's about this little herring-like fish that lives off the Atlantic coast called the Manhattan, which is kind of an ined inedible, oily beast of a herring, and it, it at least one time numbered in the hundreds of billions. It might have been the most plentiful animal on the surface of the planet, maybe outnumbering all the other fish, and it's at the very bottom of the food chain, and people can't really eat it, but everything else does. And one of the things we're doing with the Manhattan, which seems you know, really not all that bright, is vacuuming, vacuuming them up like Mr. Burns from The Simpsons and grinding them into fish fertilizer and spreading them all over the ground, you know, when we have all sorts of other ways of making fertilizer. And so, you know, we're stripping the whole bottom of the food chain out of the Atlantic coast, and a lot of that seems to have to do with political corruption in the eastern U.S. states. So it's a, it's a remarkable book. Cod, I love that too. Mark Kulansky is a great author, and, you know, reading about the devastation of the cod fishery in the east coast is just enough to make the you know, bottom fall out of your heart because it was so damn dumb. You know, everybody knew it was coming and people pretended that it wasn't and we devastated a res resource that was really the pride of the country and, and also a mainstay of, of the world economy for five, six hundred years, you know. So if you look at this map, the light blue areas there are the pelagic zone. And, you know, they look pretty big up in the Arctic. Remember, this is all stretched out because it's not a very intelligent projection. But all the dark blue stuff, man, that's deep. Two miles deep on average, and it can be 11,000 feet deep in places. And the problem with that is it's really dark. No light gets down there. It's really cold. It's not much above freezing. It's really high pressure, like higher pressure than the surface of Venus. And so it's not that hospitable for life. There's not a lot around there. And you know, the problem with that, at least in part, is, well, A, that's most of the ocean, and B, it's mostly empty, but because it's cold and dark, the things that do live there, well, they're not very well understood, but they also don't grow very fast. So if you do fish them, and we are fishing them, then, you know, you fish them, and it's like harvesting the trees that grow up in the Arctic, you know? They take forever to grow back. So, and as we fished out the pelagic zone, which we're, which we're doing at a fairly rapid rate, we've increasingly turned to the neuritic zone, with, especially with trawlers that can now reach 2,000 meters down to the bottom of the ocean. And, um, you know, it's not high quality food, generally speaking, but the problem too is we don't understand it well, and it seems quite easy to devastate. And there's other awful things that really are kind of difficult to tolerate when you read about them and trawling is one of them and here here's a nice description of trawling um, basically what a trawl does is it's a huge net that's put behind a really big boat and the net is weighted down and has rollers there's a bunch of different kinds of them it has rollers and you put it on the bottom of the ocean it sort of digs down to a depth of about eight inches and then you just drag the thing and you drag it till the net fills up. And well, what does it fill up with? Well, whatever's down there coral, 
So especially now that they're fishing out the deeper areas of the ocean, all the corals coming up, 300 pound chunks of it, maybe they figure it takes 10,000 years to grow. And you know, that's habitat for, for fish. You run a trawler over an area, there's nothing left of it. It takes everything. You haul it up, what happens? You take your 10% of the damn fish that's in there that you want to eat and you throw 90% back because that's what you have to do by law. So the bycatch, so to speak, which is what you don't want, is 90%. Back it goes into the water. Now, remember I showed you the continental shelf. There's not that much of it. Well, we've trawled most of it. So when that isn't stopping and the trawlers are getting bigger, there's something they called a super trawler that was heading down to Australia, despite a lot of you know, public outcry, because the Australians are fairly sensitive about this sort of thing. You know, they get bigger and bigger and bigger all the time. And that's partly because they're, you know, because they can, and partly because they're chasing a diminishing resource. So you imagine what would happen if you, you know, went through a, you know, a nice bit of grassland or a national park with a, a net 300 feet high, and it was, you know, dragged through by tractors. You just take everything, trees, deer, moose, birds, insects, everything. Pull out the things you can eat, let everything else rot. Jesus, if it was happening on land, people would be shorting out and, and running around in circles screaming, but it's happening on the, at the bottom of the ocean and no one can see it. And it's not just happening once. There's lots of places in the North Sea which used to be clear and is no longer clear. It's muddy because of the trawling, at least in part, and because of the disturbance of the ocean floor. That place has been trawled like three or four times. So, you know, obviously that's not going to work for very long. So then the next problematic form of fishing seems to be maybe long line fishing. And so long lines are pretty much exactly what they sound like. They're very long fishing lines. And very long means up to 40 miles long and with 30 hooks per mile. And so that's 1,200 hooks. And so, you, you know, they're often catching the kind of fish that you'd like to eat. But they catch a lot of other things too, like tens of thousands of seabirds and tens of thousands of turtles and all sorts of things and sharks and all sorts of things that, you know, will eat anything that's on a baited hook. So the bycatch problem with longline fishing is also horrendous. So that's kind of... That's kind of, you know, miserable to apprehend as well. So, in 19, I'm going to pretty much fold up with this. In 1992, which was about when the cod fishery collapsed, Canada promised to protect 20% of its oceanic territory. So the idea was to put aside chunks of oceanic territory, sort of like national parks, you know, where the animals that live there and the ecosystems would be protected so that they could come back because, you know, fish come back pretty fast if you leave them alone. I read something very amusing about this very fact. Um, you know how you heard, and maybe this is wrong, but I read it several places. You know how you heard that the whole uh, Gulf of Mexico oil spill was such a catastrophe for fish? Yeah, well, there were more fish the year after the spill than the year before. And the reason for that is no one fished. So that's, you know, that's a pretty peculiar statistic, but it shows you two things. A, how many fish we take, and B, how damn fast the fish can come back if you leave them alone. The same thing happened in the North Sea in World War II. It was pretty much fished out before World War II, but no one was fishing during World War II because of German U-boats. And There was a lot of fish in the North Sea again after World War II, so if you <laughs> leave the things alone for a while, they can come back. Canada promised to protect at least 20% of its oceanic territory by 2012, in writing, in a series of major international forums where Canada signed treaties in 1992, 2002, 2003, and 2005. So not only did we promise, we promised frequently and in writing. Less than 1% is currently protected, despite the fact that Canada has one of the longest international coastlines in the world and is also home to multiple, you know how there are ecological zones, because each little geographic area has its own peculiar characteristics. And so really what you need is you need to set aside a protected area that are sort of representative of all these different ecological zones. And we have plenty of those ecological zones, zero action, 1% of our oceanic territory is protected. That's it, and you can fish in 95% of that. So what we've done in the aftermath of the Great Cod Catastrophe looks to me to be pretty much absolutely nothing. And what's weird about that, and 
at least in part. I mean, Canada is a complicated place, but the Australians have actually protected 20% of their oceanic area and have promised 20% more recently. And they, they actually seem to mean it, which is about a third as much territory as Australia actually has. So it is actually possible to set aside what are essentially national parks in the, in the ocean and let the damn fish come back. And in principle, at least, that would also be good for the fishermen because they can hang around the edges of the parks and, you know, the fish don't know where the boundaries are. They can scoop them up once they breed again. So it's a rather cataclysmic and staggering saga of insane mismanagement. And, it, you know, it, it's not, there's not much point in pointing the finger one place or another because, you know, it's pretty much everybody's fault. But it sure seems to me to be one of those things that you've got to think about as being, oh, it's, it's, it's hauntingly foolish because all of that could be there. and Why wouldn't that be a good thing? And, you know, if there was the political will in Canada, it could be done because other countries have done it. And for some reason, this is just not an on-the-radar issue, even though it's a real issue. This is actually happening. It's really not good. It's happening a lot. It's going to get worse. We're not going to have a lot of fish to eat. The oceans are going to be a pretty barren and dismal place. And we could actually do something about it. So, so that's why I decided to do this talk, even though I don't really know a lot about the oceans, you know. I, it seems to me that this situation, it's always dangerous talking about things when you sort of know something and mostly you don't, but it seems to me that the situation with the oceans is so obviously not good that you actually don't have to be an expert to notice. And so, what can be done about it? Well, you know, the only, I think the marine protected areas are a good idea. It look, you know, they, we have examples of countries doing it and it seems to work. Everyone's already figured out that it's a pretty good idea with regards to national parks on land. No one seems to really dispute that, although, you know, we could have some more national parks. So, What's the big problem about having them out in the ocean, you know, and to preserve some of the coastline and to let the fish have a fighting chance, unless we don't want to have them around. You know, and what we're facing in some ways, well, they're starting to process jellyfish for food. Because as we get rid of the fish, the, the whole ecosystem starts to turn back to what it was like 400 million years ago, before there were any fish. And there were lots of invertebrates, and, you know, we could have an ocean full of invertebrates, and I hear they press up into hockey stick, hockey puck-sized discs pretty nicely. They don't have a lot of taste, and I suppose you'd have to be a pretty good chef to make them edible, but we probably won't run out of jellyfish during our life. So, I don't know, maybe it wouldn't be a bad idea to pen a note to your MP or to the, to the Minister of Fisheries or, and just note that, you know, destroying a resource that we could actually enjoy aesthetically and practically, that destroying that seems to be not in anybody's best interest and that it's actually happening at a pretty rapid rate. So I guess that's partly what Finn is aiming at and partly why I decided to do this talk and also to get involved and to invite Dr. Hansen, who's going to, who really knows what he's talking about, who's going to speak next.